Today's guest, Max Tooney, a fitness YouTube personality turned entrepreneur with 380,000 subscribers. He shares his journey so far with us and touches on his most recent venture, Sour Strips. Please like, comment and subscribe if you enjoy. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests. Uh, we and Dan were just talking about it. Uh, the last time we, we spoke was, oof, what was 2000 and when? Well, see, I, I, I only talk to people who are verified on Instagram and since you just got it. So now, now I can talk to you, man. Now oh, you're... mate. <laughs> It took me so long to get verified. I had, I knew someone that got me actually verified, to be fair, because every time I kept applying for it, it was just like, you can't be verified. You, you haven't got enough like, money. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were just like, you don't have uh, enough notable things that you've done to uh, to, <laughs> to be verified. <laughs> meanwhile, uh, Mac, <laughs> meanwhile, Max Tuning gets verified because uh, I, 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 I literally submitted it on the app uh, as I walk in to get a haircut and then I walk out from the haircut and it's like, you're verified. I'm like, yes. Not that fast. Yeah, well, I've been trying for a while, though. And then my friend got it, and I was kind of jealous. And then she's like, yeah, I just did it through the app. I was like, I've tried that before. And I was like, let me try one more time. Did it. Went in to get a little snip. Came out 10 times cooler on Instagram. And it was, it's, love it. Yeah, because they say as well, I think if you've got any external links in your, um, in your uh, profile, then you can't get verified. So every time I was applying, I had like YouTube stuff in there, and they don't like it. See, I, I, I've heard so, I heard so much stuff. It's, no, no one, no one knows, you know, unless, mm. unless you're hearing it straight from Instagram or something. It's like, who knows, man? But what matters is that we have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's things then? How's things? How's, how's, how's life? <laughs> Just good. You know, I'm a, I'm a new age. Uh, I'm basically a professional stock investor now. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Just been dumping obscene amounts of money in the market with about five minutes of research on most of my picks. Uh, love that for me. <laughs> I used to take advice from you, and then I was like, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try doing this thing on on Twitter where I searched, and all I needed to do is read about two tweets that say "gotta buy this one." I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> uh, yeah, but what's funny is your pro your portfolio is actually up quite a lot, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I have two separate ones. I have my, I guess I'd call it my safer one. And then I have my other one, but, uh, I guess all, all in all, we have like a close to like 600 in between the two thousand dollars. Yeah. Nice. So and what's your, what's your growth rate? Obviously 2020 was anomaly, but I think you did pretty well, right? Especially on Tesla stock. Yeah. On, on Tesla, we're up like 35% like on that, on close to like a hundred shares. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I've kind of gotten like a lot of these YOLO stocks, you'll call them, you know, I'm like, I, I, you got to find the ones that are the Tesla before their Tesla, you know? Right. But the thing is, not, yeah. n not really, though, because uh, most people think you've got to find a stock at the very start of its inception, but that's not true. It's too risky. Um, you, you, want, you want a stock to be like semi-flourished. For example, Zoom, at the start of lockdown, everyone thought it was on about $150 a share, right? And everyone's like, we've missed the boat, we've missed the boat, and now Zoom's, I'm not sure what it's at now, 500 Yeah, I, I think people are always like, eh, it's too high to buy in. And it's like, you know, you could have said that at a Tesla when I was at 400 bucks, 500 bucks, 600 bucks, 700 bucks. It's like, <laughs> when is it actually too high? Correct. It's all time highs all the time, dude. That's the great thing about it. Yeah, of course. And obviously when you do your fundamental research, then you'll be able to get to a number that suits you where you're happy to invest in, right? And most, most things are projected at like 2025 earnings. So. Yeah, I just only buy stocks that go up. That's my new strategy. So <laughs> if, if, if I see any of them that go down, I don't buy those ones. I only go to those only ones that thousand percent per week is what I like to try to go for, you know? Yeah. Did, 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 you, um, did you invest in Alibaba the other day? Uh, when you did that tweet, no, I saw that it's up, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll be up even, it's going to be up even more as well. They've got, they've got a super strong balance sheet. Um, Chinese company growing really fast, so. Yeah, well, I'm, see, I'm over here just dumping money into like blackberry and all sorts of stuff you know <laughs> i had a stop on i had a stock on um robert reynolds the other day on my podcast and he loves nokia okay so obviously yes. nokia yeah nokia the nokia yeah the old phone company <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thing with like blackberry is i uh, you know i used to use blackberries back in the day and didn't even know they still made blackberries and all of a sudden now they're everyone's like, oh, they're no longer a phone company. There's a technology company and there's hurdles thing. And now it's been just booming. So who knows? 
Yeah, well, at least at least at least you're starting to get involved and you um starting to learn a few things. That's good. Yeah, I uh, it, it, it's it's wild with the whole not to make this whole like an investing podcast, but I guess it's it's like my eyes have been opened over the past like six seven months. Uh, before when I'd I'd put money into like my IRAs and you know my my safe uh, you know accounts, and I would go to this like financial advisor, and he would basically be putting it into like a lot of Vanguard funds, like the VOO, VTI, and stuff. And mm. I didn't know what he was doing. Like I I had no idea that like your IRA was just like in just stocks, and then um. I just thought like I was putting money into this account that just magically would grow. I didn't know like what it was actually doing. So, and then just one day I started re- researching a little bit more about stocks and I was like, okay, I kind of understand like what the safe ones are, what the more risky ones are. And, you know, put a little bit, a little bit in each. I have some that are probably some dumb choices, but you know, the, the risk to reward is always there, but as long as you can afford to lose it, that's the uh, key. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, let's uh, let's get off the investing. Let's go back to the start of Max Tuning. When you started YouTube in 2011, Max? Yeah, I, I, I think it was like 11 or 12 because I, I think I have a video from... I have videos like super early on on YouTube, but it was... I used to just upload and put them on like uh, lifting websites of like one rep maxes and things like that. But I would say early 2012 was when I truly like started, started into, into social, into... Be, be, becoming the the max guy on the internet, but my and why, why did you want, flourished a lot? Yeah, for sure. I mean, why did you want to actually start a YouTube channel back then? Well, so you know Nick Wright, right? yes, yeah. So he was one of the the, the OG people, OGs. Along, yeah, along with Hodge Twins, Matt Ogus, you know, Christian was even uh, you know making videos. I, I didn't find him as, as early as, as when I found like Nick and all the, you know, Scott Herman, all the people. Scott Herman, the Scooby. Ones. Yeah, Scooby, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or even what was that? Mike Chang six, six pack shortcuts, man. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I used to watch Nick on social amongst other people. And then it was kind of just like a weird serendipitous type of event where he lived in Rhode Island. I lived in Vir- Virginia and he put a tweet out that was like, uh... I'm moving to Richmond, Virginia for the summer to live with my cousin. And I was like, oh, I live in Richmond, Virginia. And I, I like messaged him. I was like, I follow, I follow your videos. And uh, if you need a gym to train at, you should come train at like the gym I'm at. And like, hey, I'm kind of strong as well. So like, if you want someone to lift with, you don't know anyone, we can lift together. And that's just how it started. I followed him. And then we, he was like, hey, you should... He, I started being in a couple of his videos. And then he was like, hey, you know, you have a big enough deadlift and a enough of a personality that I think you should like try to pick up the camera as well. And what's funny is a lot of people don't know, because I, I have no videos to show this, but I actually tried starting YouTube uh, before that, right? And I used to, I, I made like three or four videos in my condo of nutrition. I would sit down and try to talk. And then I would, I even did some like, uh, I would like, you know, show my physique update and I was like flexing on the camera and stuff. And then I just got a whole bunch of comments that kind of weirded me out. And I was like, yeah, this was, this isn't for me. And I, I was like, eh, I'm not going to be able to make it. And then I think it was a couple months later that Nick came into town and then I was like, oh, I'll try it again. And best thing I ever did. But I, I, I would say if Nick never moved to Virginia, I don't think I ever would have picked up a camera, to be honest. Was this at the point when he was training in his uh, basement? Was that the same time? Remember he was doing his basement videos? Yeah, I mean that's that's where like I found him in, in his basement days, and then um, and then he just moved. I think he went through like a bad breakup, and then wanted to get out of his town, so he moved mm-hmm. to live with his cousin for the summer. Um, but yeah, that's that's when I, I found Nick was in his basement training days. So I'm like, it's it's just wild that a lot of the relationships of people that I watch are now some of my best friends or or people that I you know have their number in my phone. It's it's wild when I think about. Like even my first expo I ever went to, I was my my buddy Daryl. Like he he told me the only the only thing he wanted was to for me to get an autograph of like Steve Cook, right? And then right. so went to this expo. And we saw we saw like Steve in the uh, back in the Optimum Nutrition booth, and then I was like out in the hallway, and there was a whole bunch of like people in line waiting to see him, and I was like zooming in trying to take a picture of him. He was like on break, and he like. He like looked over and he like way he waved me in and and like like chatted with me and everything and and it's 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 wild because flash forward like I understand like you know I was on the other side of the line right I was like someone and, and like the experience I had with him was just so wild because he was you know someone that I, my buddy super looked up to I didn't know much about him at the time and then it's like now I'm really good friends with Steve and I hopefully we can do some videos together but we like you know chat on a regular basis so it's just wild how 
you know, from where you start to where you end and the relationships you build. So. Yeah, Steve Steve Cook is such a such a great guy. Such a, I've I, I mean I've been around him for a fair few years in the expos, and I've never seen him disrespect anyone or talk badly or anything along those lines. He is such a stand up guy. Everything you see is exactly what you get. I can't say that for everyone, but Steve Cook is definitely one of those people, one of the good guys. One something I always say with my interaction with Steve and how good it was, I was like because that let, like gave a lasting impression on on just my thoughts on him, right? Because that was the first time I met him, first time I had an experience. He was so nice, went out of his way to like do a video for my buddy Daryl to send back and was just talking to us. And um, really the way that I, like he treated me the first time I ever met him. Then when I started doing expos, that's like almost always what I think back to of my, my first experience with him. And like, that's what I want to give anyone who sees me for the first time that like, I want to make sure that they feel like I really like, you know, and truly caring about like the time that they're taking out of their day to talk to me and try to get to know these people for as little of time we get to chat with them. But I was like, I, it left a lasting impression from Steve Cook to me. And that's what I wanted to leave to people who, you know, talk to me. So he really helped shape kind of like, without without even knowing it, he like helped shape how I was going to start interacting with people when I started doing similar things to what he was doing. Yeah, definitely. So how did you manage to get back on the, the actual YouTube grind? Obviously, I, it, was it because Nick, Nick told you to? And then because obviously I know firsthand that I know from being around a lot of people, YouTube is not from the outside looking in. It's very easy to do YouTube, right? But it's it's very it's not an easy job to have. It's a very hard commitment. It's something that like every, everyone can do it. But only like certain amount of people will, I, I think, eat, stick to it enough to make it. And it's a hard balance thing because I mean, when I started to when I'm now, it's it's a lot different of maybe the the entry point of what someone thinks is like a like a, a good YouTube channel, the size or whatever. So it's hard to compare. But when I started back then, it was there wasn't as much like saturation in the market, and I just thought I had like a unique enough perspective on fitness and life balance that I think it helped me a lot. But I mean, everything has changed so much back then. I, it was a lot easier. It was almost easier to make videos because you would all people cared about, like at least in the fitness industry was, hey, uh, you know, show what you're working out, give some tips on it, do a voiceover commentary. If I would even, I would, I don't even know if I'd call it vlogging then, but I'd maybe talk about gym thoughts in the car before I went to the gym and I would get comments of like, like too, too much talking, just like more lifting, more lifting, more lifting. And now I can make videos, <laughs> the next video that goes up, which will be like on Sunday, won't have any fitness in it. Not that like, you know, fitness is out of my life, but now it's almost, I don't have to put it in every single video. It's a part of like, like what's in my life. But if it, if it's not in a video, it's okay. But back then it, it had to have fitness. The whole video had to be fitness. So it's crazy an, an evolution of the channel and the people that stick around and see the growth of everything you're doing. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good to see, as well to see the innovation of the videos, as you just said. Sometimes, but it always comes back around. Like it's like a YouTube follows a certain flow. For all the fitness industry uploading them, doing loads of lifting and no, not so much talking, they love it. And then like they love it when someone else then goes out the box and sits there, like Christian does, in front of the camera and just talks deep in into the camera. And he only does a little bit of lifting. It's 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 weird how it all comes back around all the time. I guess you gotta you gotta find out like what really your purposes on YouTube to like the content you want to deliver. Whereas me, for example, you know, fitness has been a huge part of my life and a huge part of like what got me to where I'm at today. And I, and it's still very much like I, I work out just as much as I, I've, I've ever done. Um, I just think that the value that I bring to people is more in a entertainment format rather than trying to strictly be a motivational fitness influencer or, you know, strictly a, an informative fitness influencer or a nutrition informative type of channel. Whereas I think my value to people of what they get out of the channel is the entertainment, the, they can come and kind of like disconnect for a little bit, have some laughs and just come into my life. And I think that's when I started realizing that that's more what people I think are flocking to rather than how much I can lift at all times then I was like, this is the direction that I truly need to take my channel, which has been great for me because it's, I wouldn't call it easier to film, but now I don't have to stress as much because I just need to document my life. And then I try to make it into a creative, entertaining way. So I, I show big highlights that I'm doing, but I try to do it with some jokes and some laughs and some immaturity and kind of just to, to, to lighten the mood in the, the world that we're in of like fitness industries where maybe a lot of people think you can't be as like wacky or 
you have to be serious all the time, super motivational at all times. I'm like, you know, I can, I feel like I can make leaps and bounds and achievements in life while being goofy along the way. I don't need to be super serious max at all times, but. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, like you said, it's crazy with the fitness industry. I spoke about this in my last podcast with Tony Foley. Obviously, the owner was Simply Shredded. And he's seen all the guys from the very start grow and become something different. And even someone like Bradley Martin, for example, like you can see how fitness has taken everyone to the next level and just brought, I don't know, if the fitness industry exploded at such a great point, it's just took everyone outside of fitness, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I 100%. It, it's wild that of what you started doing something with and what the evolution of that has allowed people to do and the the paths that it's just taken taken everyone. I don't, I don't think anyone who started on social media forever ago ever imagined kind of the direction that their life would would take and the, the flow of everything. And but on the flip side, you see a lot of people that didn't stick with it. There's a lot of you know people that I'm still friends with that maybe started social media or YouTube around the same time as I did who were maybe the exact same size followings, but they, for whatever reason, maybe it's a lack of motivation of if their videos didn't do as well, their social didn't do as well, but they never, they didn't stick with it. And there's not, it. there's nowhere near as many people of the, I guess the group of social influencers in the fitness space. When I started, those same people are not all there now. You know, they didn't die, but right. they're just, they kind of, I don't I guess you could use you'd say they gave up or they just maybe that wasn't for them, but uh, it's it's just interesting to see how I just kept sticking with it and sticking with it and sticking with it and evolving and adapting and and I guess but it's also an enjoyment thing as well. Maybe people just didn't enjoy the process for whatever reason, whether it's the uh, the feedback they were getting or the I don't know. I, I I've had some friends that if they didn't get a lot of the views, they they would quit. And I had one buddy who basically said that. He's not getting the views that he deserves. So he's like quitting. Basically, he thought like his content was way better than the views he's getting. So he just like gave up. I'm like, that's not really the mindset. You kind of, you know, there's leaps and bounds. You know, you, you, mm. you go through different phases where you get getting a thousand views is crazy than 10,000 and then 50,000. And you got to remember those milestones and just keep going. Right. I think, yeah, I think comparison kills. That's, that's, most people are com comparing themselves to other channels, but obviously what they fail to realize is other channels like yourself have been going for 10, 12 years. They're not an overnight success. In 2021, what would you say the, the keys to YouTube growth are if someone was starting out fresh? I, I always tell people the kind of the same advice and they never want to hear it when I'm, when I'm saying like, you just need, you need to be yourself, but you need to be different than everyone else because you know you can replicate a lot of what's working if anything i would think it's almost the easier to be an influencer or a youtuber in this world because you can see the years of the the evolution and the changes and the mistakes that people have made and you can almost replicate what's now really really working whereas you, you don't you can skip a lot of the the phases now you know exactly what camera to get exactly the format you know people like little montages you know you can just do all this stuff and um but a lot of people aren't going to be consistent with it. And people think that, you know, a lot of people come up to me at the, at the fitness expos and, and they want to start a YouTube channel. And I'm like, okay, what is your channel going to be about? And they're telling me, uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to give fitness tips and I'm going to show my life. And, you know, my first kind of question is like, why do you think pe people should already like care about what you're doing in your life? Like, you know, you haven't developed any sort of relationship with, with people. I think that, I started giving value in the fitness industry a, a while ago, and that gave me validity to continue to show more of my life. Whereas now, if someone just wakes up and be like, I'm gonna show everyone that I'm what I'm eating for breakfast, it's like, why, why, why should people care about what you're eating for breakfast? Like, we well, haven't, you can't just go into the space and just think that everyone should follow your wild life. And, and everyone always thinks that you have to do like crazy things or crazy challenges or shock value or things like you know, a lot, well, a lot, a lot is working. And if you go down that path, I think then you always have to be one upping yourself every single time. Mm, right. But, and then you end up falling down that path that Logan did. So that's yeah. what he was doing. He was one upping himself and one upping Jake and him and him and Jake just started doing crazy things together. Didn't they? Every single video was one up and, and then obviously, you, you, you uh, have to, I, I've gotten DMS before and they've been like, Hey Max, I, I love your videos, but they're, you know, they get a little bit repetitive with you just kind of doing your daily things. Like you should go maybe like he even said is like, you used to go rent some like jet skis and go drive around. I was like, that's not my life. I was like, I'm not just going to go 
do wild things just for the videos. I, I, you know, I've been vlogging my life for the past couple of years. And if anyone comes in, like, this is what they're, this is what they're getting. And more, you should be following the, the growth of my, of my life. And I, th- I think what people need to focus on when they build these channels is developing a story and you have, you know, your short-term goals, your midterm goals and your long terms, and people can follow along with that, whether that's business or you have, I, I think the biggest thing is having some sort of focus and direction and goals for whatever it is that you're trying to get across to people. Whereas for me right now, people are, I think, following a lot of my life because they're seeing the businesses that I started. I'm show, I'm showcasing a lot of the ups and downs of that. I'm showcasing from when we started to as we grow. I give a lot of information. I'm, you know, I guess leveling up in my own life of like getting my first house, getting my dog, and then I'm showing the like renovations of the house. I'm I'm letting people in a lot in my life, and I think that's where uh, people can relate to because. They, they see me getting stressed out. They see me things not working out for me and me having to like adjust my plan. And you know, I think it's very relatable to people and they can kind of follow along and see what I'm doing, you know? So how long after you started your YouTube channel, did you actually begin to start a business? I think your first company was ever forward, was it? Yeah. I, well, I, I guess technically I started deadlift bra shirts, you know? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> where I, I put a silhouette of me lifting weights. And then, and then when I launched Ever Forward, which is, uh, I guess, August of 2014, it was late 2014 was when I launched the brand, but I still had me associated with it. I took the deadlift bra silhouette and I put it on the back of the shirt. So it had the Ever Forward, but it was like, oh, it still has uh, my, you know, my silhouette on the back. So it's tied to me. And even on the hang tags, I put like my YouTube channel link. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so I started this brand that tried to associate with me, but then quickly into that, I was like, you know, I think maybe we should just disconnect myself from the brand as much. So I don't think my name or my image needs to be on the clothing. And uh, yeah, so started that in late 2014. And I I remember our chats at the Olympia when I was telling you about, I guess, I was like, oh, yeah, we sold like 300 shirts in, you know, like an hour, it was wild and all this stuff. And I remember sitting down and telling you, telling you kind of on my vision, and how I was going to like grow it. And then it's wild to think back from, you know, our conversation to what it is now. So yeah, incredible. Cause no, I remember the exact same. We were sat down, you were telling me about Ever Forward. You told me the name. I think you said it's related to your dad. Is that what you, that's what you told me, right? Yeah, that's where the phrase came from. So my dad, my dad was in the military for a long time and then he passed away back in 2005. But his kind of mantra was Ever Forward, uh, which is an old military mantra, I guess you'd, you'd say. So it was very much a part of his, uh, core value. And with our family, it was kind of a saying, a lot of my family members have it like tattooed on them. And then when I wanted to create a brand, I guess in my head, I was, I, I used that because it, it wasn't necessarily like, I want to start a clothing brand for my dad. It was more, I want to start a clothing brand. And instead of maybe thinking up a brand name or a direction, I was like, here's something that I don't need to, I guess, convince people of what the message means or convince people what it means to me because like it already I'm just telling people what it does mean to me. And here's why I chose this name or this phrase rather than, I guess, thinking up a brand name. Um, So it was just the clear choice for me. And it seemed to resonate well with a lot of people. And uh, yeah, it's just it's it's cool to see what it what it grows it with what it has grown into. And what were, what were some of your first steps when you first started the company? So you thought of the brand, obviously ever forward. You had it in your mind for a while. Where did you go from there? To be honest, I got a lot of inspiration from you guys and Gymshark because I saw everyone was kind of doing clothing and, and merch and in the the YouTube space. Everyone's starting to start a clothing brand. You know, now everyone has a clothing brand, but back then it was still people are, okay, they make some shirts with their, their YouTube channel slogan on it or their fr- whatever, something related to their channels, like merch, I guess you would call it. And then I was like, okay, okay I want to start like a brand that's not a max fitness or deadlift bra or whatever. And I saw, I, I really, I think Gymshark actually sent me a package of, y'all sent me a bunch of stringers and, and joggers and stuff like forever ago, like uh, when I was right out of college. And I was really admiring. I was like, wow, like, it's cool that they have these like custom bags and these like hang tags and, you know, just like the details. Oh, it has like a a neck label. And I was, I, so that was like, I was like, this, I think is going to be the new standard of what people are going to expect is no longer can you, can you do these Gildan t-shirts screen printed and just kind of shoved it in a, in a mailer bag and sent it off. So I got a lot of inspiration to kind of 
step up the quality a little bit and go overseas and try to get a, a more unique fabric. And, you know, then it just kind of uh, evolved from there. So, but then I, I quickly learned about all of the headaches that come along with manufacturing that now I, I tell, not that I tell people no one should start a clothing brand, but I'm just like, you have no, like, unless you're very going to be into this, you don't understand the amount of headaches and problems and money you're going to have to spend to get this going and the the frustrations you're going to you're going to see and the the just the errors and the the you you approve a sample and you're like this is exactly what's going to be and you get the bulk and you're like this is very different and then the manufacturer is like no it's the same you're like no it's not and then you have to fight to get your money back or a discount and it just i mean i'm mean, you've probably seen a million times it's just it's not a, a clear clear path it's 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 so much ups and downs and it's a lot of frustration so yeah a lot of a lot of trying to iron that out as well it does come down to processes it does sometimes you know you might have the wrong manufacturing and and sometimes you know they've got to go but a lot of it does come down to processes approval and just having the right people on board especially in those places to to fun fact i'm using that. the same i have i have a couple more now but my main manufacturer is the same one that i like the first ever one that I got my samples and my first shirt from. Yeah. I've, they've teams like they've swapped a representative, but it's the same factory. So that's that's pretty rare. And wow. I, I tried every now and then. I was like, I'm gonna go to a different manufacturer to outsource into another one. And then I was just dog shit every single time. <laughs> and uh, but I, I, again, a lot of things. I tried being transparent with a lot of people. Sometimes I would get items in, and instead of maybe trying to, that would be completely wrong. Whether it's uh, the logo immediately started like peeling or cracking or something. And instead of trying to be trying to sell it and then act like it was all perfect. Uh, so it happened maybe three or four times where I, I would tell my YouTube channel, I'm like, Hey, this is what I wanted it to be. It ended up not being it. I got screwed by manufacturer. Like the logo is, is peeling. Um, I don't, it's a complete loss on this. So I like, I want to sell it to you guys. If you want to buy it, knowing this, you know, at a 60% discount and I'll just t take the L just to cover the kind of the clothing. And people were like, really not that they wanted defective clothing, but I guess the people really appreciated that I was transparent with them. And then like, I wasn't happy with it and I wasn't trying to sell them something that I wasn't happy with. So, um, I guess there's been a lot of steps uh, along the way that I think has helped the brand out a lot. And documenting it is, is one of the biggest things because if you just start a brand, I, I, you know, you see so much behind the scenes and I think people really, really appreciate that and can connect more with the brand because they've seen it from start to, from inception to, you know, it's, it's growth. And I, I, think it, I think it really helps people connect more with the brand rather than just be like, this is a new sick clothing company. You should get it because this is what it represents. And this is, if you wear this, like this is how you're going to, you know, feel because of this message that's on the shirt. And uh, I, I think it's, you need to have that connection with, with, with everything. And I think a, a business has, um, is no different than how to get people to watch your YouTube videos and how to get people to maybe purchase a, a product or a service that you offer. Where, where do you want to take ever forward now? I mean, it's, it's just like 2014, you started. So what was seven, basically seven years old? Where do you yeah. want to take the brand? So we've changed a lot in the direction in terms of, I, I really want to go to that, uh, I guess, clean classic look. I like this, this simple minimalistic that a lot of people are, are doing. But I, I think the brand is very a non like trendy, trendy brand. So we'd, I, I try not to do things that are maybe fashion trends that I see, whether it's, and again, a lot of people have success in this. So I'm just saying it for my own personal, personal brand, but maybe like long, long tees or things with like holes in it or, or things like that. Like that's just not the direction I, I, I see for the brand. Um, so I want like a clean classic look. I think it's, I want a company that maybe uh, is, it's for someone who maybe doesn't know how to dress in like a, maybe a, a, a casual setting. And I'm like, you know, he, he, this is the apparel for you. This is, you know, I can give you your whole look. We have some, we're, we're expanding into like khaki pants and like, you know, polo tees and button downs. And, and I want to like help a lot of people who maybe don't have, I guess, the fashion sense to know what to wear, what to pair with what. I want to kind of give people that direction. So um, a, a lot are, of brands. Are, are you a fashion icon now, are you? No, I, I just, I... <laughs> I just, uh, I, I guess I looked up to a lot of brands like um, J. Crew and like Brooks Brothers and even like Polo Ralph Lauren. And I really admire that style of clothing. And I, I appreciate, um, I guess, the, the, the time, 
the timelessness and classicness of a lot of what they offer. I want to create pieces that are, you know, that don't that don't go out of style, that aren't like trends, whether it's, you know, our bomber jackets or like polos or button downs. Like, you know, these are always going to be in style. You can wear these year round. It's not um, just kind of like trendy fashion. And a lot of people have great success at that. But um, I, I think I found instead of trying to do what I think everyone will buy, I just do what I think is like true to the core nature of the brand. And um, if it's a, a slower growth pattern, I'm, I'm okay with that. And so it's, it's just really interesting. We're, we, ha- we have our own retail space in, in uh, Christian's new Alpha Land building. So I'm super excited for that. We, we loved, I want to start doing a lot more events. We had a pop-up in New York City that was a very, I don't even know the type of the, the theme you would say, but it had like a, this, it, really, it felt like I was walking into a J. Crew store and I really, really liked that. And I loved the experience I had with that. I'd like to do a lot more pop-ups and I don't know, man, year over year, I think the brand kind of changes and then it grows and it evolves and we'll see where this conversation, you know, ask me this again in a couple of years and we'll, we'll see where it went, you know. How is, um, how is Alpha Land going? Obviously, I, I message Christian every time, all the time, but he, he doesn't reply because you know what he's like. He's too busy. He, I, I don't even <laughs> think he opens, and he might also open Instagram like once a, once a month or something, once in a blue moon. Um, it, it's, it's going, I guess the only thing I could say is it's going to be amazing. It's just going to, it's just taking some time to get there because if anyone knows Christian, he is such a, I don't know if perfectionist is, but he has such these big, big visions and big dreams. And I don't think he wants to have anyone experience Alpha Land until it's the exact vision that he has. And the vision that he has is just wild. Um, and I think it's going to be a, a truly an iconic location in the country of, 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 of a hub, a place, we can, a place that people can go to connect it with, with, with fitness. And you know, the Alpha Lead Gym has, has grown so much. And it's crazy seeing him expand from the, his thousand square foot gym that I visited with Nick Wright back in 2014, 15 to, you know, the four gyms he's had in between to alpha land. And, um, he's putting in tons of work and it's taken a lot more time and money than I think he imagined. Cause when he rented this or when he bought the building in February, I think his plan was to open it by June. It was a very short amount of time. And just, and then then it was like, okay, then it's going to be it's going to be August. It's going to be November. It's going to be December. Okay. Definitely by January, we're going to do it. Okay. February, at least the office people are going to be in there. Now it's estimated, I think April to be completely open to the public and maybe around March that like, like myself, for example, and other people that are going to be in the office buildings can be in, but it, it's all, it's going to be wild when it's done, man. It, it's going to be really, really cool. How has, how has obviously COVID affected the whole situation with Alpha Land? Um, I know that a lot of, uh, they've had to do a lot more like precautions and I guess sanitations on the building. I know a lot of the workers, he now is a project manager that, you know, ensures everyone's, you know, doing things up to code. I know for a while he ran into some issues where some of the workers ended up getting us. They had to shut it down. They had to sanitize, get new workers in that were all tested. And, um, now there's a lot more procedures I'm sure with, with everything that's happening, but he went through a, a little bit, a little bit of a bumpy phase, but now it's, pretty full steam ahead. It, it's really, really coming together. If, if anyone, if you were to walk the property, you would understand, pe- people can't wrap their head around the, the scale of this building and like the, the, the things that he's doing to it. And then you understand why it's taking so long because he's trying to have this wild, he doesn't want to have like the soft opening. He doesn't want to have a, a lackluster experience when people come in that he wants to be grand on the first one. It's kind of like when you when you renovate a house, or you buy a house, and everyone's like, "You don't need to do everything all at one time." Christian's like, "I want to do it all at one time. <laughs> I want to have." He, he wants to have the entire building, the whole facility, what it exactly should be. Not like, okay, you know, a couple months down the road, then we're going to upgrade the offices. We're going to do all this. He's just going all in right now. So, I'm excited for it to be open, and I'm also excited for it to be somewhat finished. Even though there's phase two and three that he hasn't told the world about with that f- facility, but I'm excited for Christian to kind of maybe take a step back and relax for a little bit because he's just overworking himself is even like an understatement, man. I, and it, it's, it sucks as a friend seeing someone who's just like, he's, he's mm. drained every day. He's going like days and days without sleeping. And he's just, whether it's lack of help or trying to be 
his hands into everything. And it's just, it's sometimes it's hard as a friend to see someone like stressed out so much and there's nothing I can really do about it, you know? Yeah, I think the thing goes well with Christian. Like I said, I think he wants to do a lot of hands-on stuff himself where he could outsource it and he could get some... He could, he could build a big structure to help him get to A to B a lot faster. That was one thing we learned. He could definitely do that. Um, but every time you t- you take a picture of him saying he's still alive and stuff, I mean, <laughs> he, 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 looks, he looks like he's working hard. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you hear about people like, oh, you know, 12-hour days, you know, 10-hour days, like 80 hours a week. I was like, Christian's the epitome of that. He, he is just days without sleeping. He just he lives and breathes this project. And I think a lot of people are upset because maybe he's not making videos right now. But again, when those people come and enjoy Alpha Land and they see the project, they will completely understand why he had to kind of separate himself from social to, to build this legacy of a, of a complex for the people to enjoy. And um, it, it's, it's, it's good. I think it's all going to be worth it. I'm, I just, he needs to take like a four week vacation and just leave his phone and laptop, you know, in the room and just lay on the beach for a while. Yeah. I'm, I can't wait to come. I mean, I'm definitely going to come over when it opens. What did, when did you say it was going to open? August? You know, every single, every single week, it's, it's a different date, but uh, the, the most recent update that I have is he's estimating April for it to be open to the public. Right. But it's coming together like a lot now, like the flooring's going in, all the lights are in, the walls are all, getting primed to like so it's in the final stages it's just going to be all the crazy custom touches this man has a hologram machine in his like retail store that can this like wild machine and i'm like to, to literally have holograms for the clothing for the people like an like legitimate hologram machine like <laughs> it's like what and he just like has these ideas and he's like, I want a hologram machine. And, the, and now there's a giant hologram machine that you're like, I don't even know, like, where did you find this? And uh, it's, it's wild. And you see these like 3D renders of the building on his, and you're like, wow, this looks lavish. And he's like, this is exactly what it's going to look like, which, and I, I totally believe it. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. He, yeah. As I said, I'd like him to reply to me, but I understand that he's, <laughs> he's very busy, man. Don't worry. He, he doesn't reply to me either. So <laughs> I just, I just have to, <laughs> the only time I talk to him is when I go there around five every day and I, I come into the office. I'm like, you want to work out? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He t- comes over. He, he takes a scoop of your workout. He does one to two sets of flies. And then I look away and he's walking back to his office with his iPad because he like is writing down and he goes, sometimes he'll take pre-workout and then immediately just get on his iPad and then walk back to the office. He'll take pre-workout, not work out and just go back. Like, so I, I talked, I see him every day, but he's not there, you know? <laughs> so. Mm, mm, mm. No, I can relate. I can relate for sure. Yeah. So why? So let's move on to obviously sour strips. Why did you then? Dis, so you obviously you got YouTube's going really well. I mean, you renovated your property right recently as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I got a house. This is that house that you're in now. This is this, this, this is the house I'm in. Nice, nice. We'll get onto that. So you've got your property. You've got Ever Forward. You got your YouTube channel, and then you decided to go down the route of sour strips. Why was that? I, I was like, I want to never run out of candy in my entire life. <laughs> I no, think, I, he, sorry, just to interrupt, everyone listening, Max is obsessed with candy. Yeah. You know, like it, people don't even under, like wrap their head around it. I could talk about this for an hour, but I guess the idea for Sour Strips was that I, I, I saw, I guess it was just like a crazy idea. I see everyone maybe starting like energy drinks or starting products that they love and enjoy. And my thing was, I was like, I, ever since I've been about 10 years old, I've been a diehard candy fan. I, I can honestly say that since I've been about 10 or 11, every single gas station, every single grocery store, every single convenience store, every time I've gone into a store in the past 20 years, I'm not even exaggerating that I walk up and down the candy aisle. So I, I've, 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 I want to see what the new products are. And I've seen a lot of products that like come and go that I've liked or disliked. And then I've just always seen like the branding. And then I had the, the idea, I was like, well, what if I could create a brand that that if I was walking down the aisle, it would catch my attention? Because it's not with the candy world, it's not every day that a new a new candy brand pops up. You know, you have a new flavor of Skittles, you have like a new flavor or tropical version of maybe a sour patch, but it's rare that like a new brand comes out. And as I started going down the path of trying to source manufacturers and start the process, 
I found out why because I was like, it's, it's quite difficult to source all these things and to do it because I started when I had the idea, I originally actually had two partners with me. So we were going to be equal third partners. And th they were going to handle all the business side back of it. And I was just going to be the marketing face of the brand. Because they're like, we don't we don't care to be a part of it. We just want to grow this thing. And we tried for like, six to seven months sourcing manufacturers, talking with suppliers and getting samples and trying to tweak them and just getting really frustrated. And then it just kept hitting roadblocks because I had a, I, I knew exactly what the candy needed to taste like, feel like, look like in the bag. Like I, I knew everything that I hated about other candy brands. Maybe when you, you open it up and it's all like wet and like sticky and they're sticking together and you're like kind of pissed. And I'm like, I don't want any of that. So we tried and tried and tried for months. And then this was while I was still living in Virginia. And then it just kind of fizzled out. We kind of just couldn't find what we're looking for. I was really picky with what I wanted. And then about six months went by. I was like, maybe this just isn't, it isn't possible. So this is why no one starts candy brands because it's very, very hard. Um, and there's not a lot of research. You can't look at people who start clothing brands like, okay, I can, I, I can see how they've done it. I can't hit up Haribo or Trolley or, you know, Mondelez and try to find out how they started the candy brands, these huge conglomerate companies. So I kind of gave up on it. And then when I moved to Texas, I remember I was just sitting in my office. And I was like, I, I can, I can do this. I can, I can find out how to make this work. I was like, if people are making drinks and bars and snacks and stuff, and I was like, I can make candy. Uh, so I just sat down and I continued to talk to manufacturers and sources. And I think it, it all, and it wasn't until I found out where I could get candy made. That's when I saw, I didn't even have a, a name at the time uh, or a, a name. And then I was in my office and I thought up sour strips. I was like, okay, that's a very generic term there. They are sour strips. And there'd been other candies that had called there, like trolley had made some sour strips. And my idea behind the name was like, do they have Kellogg's Frosted Flakes over there, dude? Yeah. Okay. So if like, if someone went to the store and you were like, hey, pick me up some Frosted Flakes. And they came back with, you know, some store brand flakes, right? You'd be like, no, I said Frosted Flakes. Like, I wanted this because Frosted Flakes is just a generic term for what it is, but they turned it into a brand, Frosted Flakes. You want, like, you know, you want Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. So I thought up, I was like, in, instead of calling it so-and-so candy sour strips as the type, instead of making the, the company name, I was like, what if the, the generic brand name is so powerful that people, it do, anyone can make a sour strips candy because it's a descriptive term of what the candy is, but people only want sour strips, like the actual sour strips. I was like, I wanted to make the, the, the Kellogg's Frosted Flakes of candy with the branding. That was like my idea behind it. And then I went on to Instagram and I, and I realized no one had taken sour strips at Instagram. And then I went, went to GoDaddy and no one had taken sourstrips.com. That's and I was crazy. Like, I know. I was like, what? <laughs> what is it? I was like, how is no one taking this? So it was, then I locked it in and then it's, the rest is kind of history. Yeah. So it's only been a year and a half. Has it, has it taken over ever forward in terms of time and revenue? A everything. It's, what's crazy is from 2019 was our best year ever for ever forward. Um, and then we took last year and it's, I'm taking all the blame. There's no one else to blame. You can blame COVID or whatever, but for 2020, we took a like a almost a 45 percent hit of our gross revenue from our best year ever, 2019, and it's because sour strips just consumed my life, and it took over so much that I put Ever Forward on a back burner, and I wasn't hiring as many people, so I just thought that I could still um, talk to my suppliers and get the Ever Forward thing going. But then, you know, you know, you get a sample in and I was like, okay, I was like, I'll, I'll review the sample in a, a day, a day, a week, a week. And it kept pushing back. And then by the time I do changes and it, a week turned into a month and I just kept putting it on the back burner because I was like, the sour strip thing is just taking off so much and it's taking so much of my time. And so I, ever forward took a huge hit because of the success that sour strips had and a lot of lack of management on my end. But now this year, a lot more things are in place. And this year, we should be able to balance both a lot more and get Ever Forward back to what it was in 2019 and then can continue to set ourselves up for success in the future. But Sour Strips just does take so much of my time because it just it catapulted with, with just the growth. And it's been more than I could imagine. And now we're starting to roll out into like retail. That's going to be a huge push for this year. And it's 
I never could have imagined that it was going to take off like as much as it did. I think, I think honestly, what you and Christian have done both with you, with your new brand, Sour Strips and his 3D and the retail aspects bring in, so, you've brought, you have brought social media into a retail space. And I think that that is the next big boom. I think you're going to see a lot of people start to copy you now. Well, I think it's a crazy concept when you walk into a, a store and you see an energy drink, you know, brand created by like someone that you know, it's because it, it, it's like goes from an idea to like an online thing. And when it's in a, a gas station, or it's, it's in a grocery store, that's when it's like almost real. Like, right. I, I have numbers to back up the success of Sour Strips. But when I first got into our first gas station or this like HEB grocery store chain, and now we're expanding into Target, like when I see it in there, I'm like, now it's a real brand. Now it's a, a, not just like a, this online popular thing now it's 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 tangible it's in a store like people who just walk down to get some oatmeal you know can see this and and, and pick it up and who have never you never those people may have never have, would found it find it on the internet and now it's it's staring at them them in the face and it's it's super cool to see how someone from the internet and i think a lot of people even i don't say attack it but whenever someone starts a new brand i guess they don't take it as seriously because they're like that could never that can never work. And then it starts working and then you start getting into stores and then it starts becoming a, a reality. And it's, it's just wild. And it, it's, it's super cool to see. And the fact that I'm in some of the stores that also Christian are in to see, you know, one of my best friends, we both have products in a grocery store. I think it's just super cool. Did he, um, did he help with connecting you to the right people? In regards no. To stores? No? It, no, he, I mean, Christian helped a lot. A lot of people helped a lot with like the design of the packaging and the bags and the logos. But um, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I single handedly took sour strips everything because it's it's a team effort on everyone that's that's helped me grow. But I, I guess I don't have. There was no business part. I, again, I left those business partners after you know months and months and months, and I was just going to do it on my own. So everything that I'm doing, I'm learning new every day. And, you know, Christian has some business partners that helps him with, with 3D, a lot more of the back end because there's no way he'd be able to, to com continue to scale that business if he didn't have those to, to have the help because he just couldn't add it to his plate of, of stuff he's doing. And, um, for me that that's why everything's taken such a, a hit because I have to focus so much because it's an industry that, yeah, people are in maybe the, the, beverage category, but the candy category is a little bit different because I'm finding out that <laughs> I have no one, I have no one directly to like ask for advice on a candy product because no right. one's really done the same thing. So, so what, what are you doing? Cause it's a question that you probably get asked all the time the same with me. So for example, I'll let, how do you do this? How do you do that? The simple answer is Google. <laughs> uh, yeah. The Google is like, it, it's, I think a lot of people, when they start any company, they, they go to Google and if they can't find it in five minutes, then they're like, okay, so-and-so needs to tell me exactly how to do it. And I think that's a lot of the problem because when people ask me, hey, who, who's your clothing supplier or whatever? And I'm like, it's not that I, people aren't telling your clothing supplier because like it's, if anyone uses my supplier, then my business is going to go down and never, your, your business is going to take over because using my supplier. Um, I, I just, when, it, when someone asks me, hey, how do I find a manufacturer or whatever? I'm like, you're about to get into a business that is going to consume your life and you can't even do research and due diligence on your own. You don't have the patience to even try. Because if you took 10 minutes, you could like find, you know, Alibaba. You could find, you know, bulk gym t-shirt manufacturing five minutes in. You could, you could find these things. And if people aren't, can't even do research to, to start the idea, I'm like, I don't think you're going to have the energy to put this in to make it like an actual real thing. Yeah, that's so important. I totally agree. There's, there's sometimes it takes weeks to find information, weeks of emails and call, and calling or whatever it may be and talking to different people before you get any little bit of, you know, sometimes as well on Google, it's almost a skill to find out how to Google and especially like Twitter, how to search through Twitter for the right things. But it is a skill that needs to be developed. And I totally agree with you. I hate it when people ask me the most simplest questions, like you no. can just Google and get the answer. Well, the, I think a lot of and I'm not saying this is the, the same for, for everyone. And I'm not saying that uh, people don't get assistance. But most people that I know that are very successful in what they're doing did not ask someone how to start that business. Or they just, they just did it. They took action. Um, they didn't 
you know, when I started the clothing thing, I wasn't asking people, how do I start a clothing manufacturer? I was like, I'll just kind of figure it out with the candy thing. I, I've, I was like, how do I find someone who makes candy? You know, how, how do I, how do I find people who make the bag? Who, who, who do I, how do I know what to put on the nutrition labels? Like, you know, I, I didn't know all this, this information. I was like, I didn't know what legally has to be on the packaging. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people just don't want to put in the work on the initial thing. They only want the upside of whether, whatever the success of the brand and the growth. So if, if you can't put in the work in the beginning stages, then I don't think that you're really cut out for the business you're trying to get into. Right. And some like a rough ride, you know? Absolutely. And sometimes, right, some questions don't need to be answered until you actually get there. And when you get there, you then can start to pick apart things. If if you think 10 years ahead, then you're going to have a struggle starting because you're going to see so many obstacles to overcome. You're not even going to want to start. That's what is that everything I've ever started. I now a little bit more mature and I, I understand where things go. But back back then I'd start something and I wouldn't even think what happened next. And as soon as I go, all right. We need this. Okay, well, let's Google. Let's see what we need to do now. Oh, okay, well, that that needs certain regulation or, you know, we need to start, have a Yori number to import this product. Okay, so what's a Yori number? Yori number, apply now. You know, things like that. They just mm-hmm. don't need answering right away. Have you ever had any failures, Max? I think I've had a lot of, I, I, I guess in relation to, to business, I never really look at anything as failures. I, I see a lot of like launches that don't do as well. I, I see like ideas that I have that don't come to fruition. Um, I don't know. I've been asked that question before and I, it's not like I've like never failed at anything, but I, I, I guess nothing that I've done is ever like crumbled in front of me. I think what I do is when I see something that maybe isn't working out or panning out as much as I, I think it is, I just immediately deviate from that and I immediately like change change positions in what, in what I'm doing. And, and I try to minimize any sort of like failure. But I, I, I guess I haven't started anything that has been some wild loss or, or failure. But, but I guess, I mean, there's been a lot of ups and downs with the clothing thing. Like I said, I've, I've gotten manufacturers where I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of items, and it's just been a complete loss. And I've had to, you know, just donate them all to the to the goodwill. I tried doing these like fleece zip over pullovers, got the sample of uh the logo embroidered. And then when I got it, it looked like my dog had done the embroidering on it. It was just so bad. And I was like, Oh, and I had like hundreds and hundreds of these things. And I was like, what am I going to do? And, um, I think, I think a lot of times people get caught up in failures and like downs and then they, they just immediately quit or get, or give up. I mean, it, even like, if you look at like social media, a lot of people always want this upward trajectory of like growth and you look at someone, even like my YouTube channel, like I, I really, I have great engagement. I appreciate everyone that like watches all my videos. But if you truly look at like the growth of my YouTube in the past two years, it's like almost like a flat line. Like it's just, it's just like that. And a lot of people would give up because they're like, it's not growing. It's, it's not going down, but it's not growing. It's just like kind of staying where it is. And I'm like, you just need to be like, okay, well then where you're staying, how do you maximize everything you're doing with the the line that you're on? And I, I don't get obsessed with trying to do like growth hacks and all these crazy things. I just, I'm like, you know what? I just keep being me and it goes up, it goes up, you know? Mm, I like it. Can you just say one more thing for me? Um, say Harry Bob again. You know, I... <laughs> <laughs> I called it Haribo and then someone corrected me and was like, Haribo. <laughs> I have never heard that in my Haribo? life before. God, no, now I got to slap someone, dude, because, yeah, Haribo is how I would call it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's what we said, Haribo. And when you said Haribo, I looked at Dan, I was like, what's he on about? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, it's just like, I. do you call it uh, Ibiza or Ibiza? Ibiza. Okay, see, uh, I'm over here, Ibiza. Yeah, I'm like, it, there's a Z. <laughs> which is and probably Rob's right. like, Ibiza. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty right. That's pretty right. So your house... You did you renovate it all yourself or did you get a full contractor in? So I bought this house and I I got a couple of different contractors, but basically I had a designer, an interior designer that he kind of used his people that he knew, whether it was I, I got one guy that can do all the demo and rebuild. I got one guy that can do be the carpenter for all the, the cabinets and everything. So I, it was, I guess, his like team. And I'm super happy that I went with him because if I just got a random contractor and I was just given the vision of it, so much has had changed while we were building out that I'm so glad that I had someone that had a design mindset rather than just someone who was just doing the task that I 
that I uh, told him. But this house uh, has been the world's biggest money pit in the entire world. It's beautiful now. And it's, it's what you look at it and you're like, wow, this is amazing. But the amount of headaches and money spent on this damn thing, because it's like a can of worms. You, you tear down a wall, you start seeing all this stuff. You're building from scratch or are you doing renovations on all your... Um, so I, at this moment in time, I'm not doing anything, but I was doing a little bit of both building from scratch and renovations. Okay, yeah, because I saw I saw all those uh, ones you did. And, and that, that's what we when I showed the first house and I, I see the idea. It's um, a lot of people are like, oh, that's a piece of crap. It's never going to be. And then, you know, you've, you've turned from, you've turned dumpsters into palaces, right? With your, with your, with your renovations. And that's what this house, this house went from. Because people come in like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's like, you, you have no idea what this place looked like and how shitty it was when I got it. And then the, the problem, see, the great thing is that I share everything. And the problem is that I share everything because then it's pretty crazy that I have actually experts in every single field, <laughs> every single field that I do in my life, whether it's business or home renovations, all my subscribers there's a million experts that are telling me how wrong I'm doing something, how dumb I am for doing something, how like, and I'm just, I'm just like, okay. So you got to find that balance of getting people's opinions and then pushing people's opinions away that are maybe you have a, a bigger vision than what they're, they're just seeing like the one thing that you showed them rather than a bigger picture of the entire thing. And did you pick this house for location and where you wanted to live long-term or for this money? Was, this was the first house that I even got shown <laughs> so my, my realtor was just like hey here's a house and I like walked it and I was like oh I love it let's put an offer in so I didn't even look at anything else I, I, I liked I wanted to be close to to work and like to the gym and everything and Christian and a lot of the the squad I would guess is all around this area within a five to ten mile radius and I knew I wanted to be no no more than like 15 20 minutes from the from the gym or from the office and with, with this house I really really liked it because it was a co it's corner lot has like a circle driveway. It's on it's on the lake. It has a yard. It had a pool. Um, it had like un it, it has an un unobstructed view of the lake as well. Um, where there's you know I can see for a quarter mile down the lake. It's not like a, I have a baby little lake view. So there's a lot of like things that happened with the house that made that made me choose it. And then I had a budget of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for renovation and. Now I'm all I'm all done, and including furnishing everything, we like almost hit 400 on this house, mm -hmm. and I bought it for 500. So wow, <laughs> yeah. So the the biggest thing is uh, I like to say instead of saying I bought a 500 thousand dollar house, uh, put a hundred down and then put 400 into it. I like to say that I bought a eight to nine hundred thousand dollar house that was beautifully renovated, and I put 50 percent down. You know, <laughs> I like to word it. Have you um have you remortgaged it? Uh no, I, I talked with my, my guy and I guess the mortgage rate that I got was pretty decent, but he was saying that the amount or like everything we do to get the refinance to get a lower rate wouldn't really do a lot for me. So yeah, but I mean, your, your, like your the, the equity in your house is obviously massive. So surely you'd want to pull some of that out, right? Uh see, I'm new to all this, so I don't know exactly the what all goes into that. I know that well, you get it reappraised to so yeah, so, a higher value. No, no, no. Yeah, correct. So obviously you, your, your initial mortgage was $500,000, right? And obviously you put down 100K and obviously you've now put in another 400,000 pounds. So you, that's 900,000 pounds. So your house is not, you, if I was to buy your house off you, right? Mm -hmm. How much would you charge me? You wouldn't charge me 500,000. Yeah. No, yeah. But, but I guess that that's the biggest thing with doing all the renovations. You know, my realtor and everyone was like, you know, don't put more in than what the house is going to be worth. So you know, Correct. just because you've it's nine hundred thousand worth from the the renovations and everything doesn't mean someone's going to pay you nine hundred thousand. But I, I don't know what I would sell this for. I, got, I my idea with this house is to probably live here for like five years, and then I want to build something like truly custom. Right, but even your house, this house now, if you in terms of like reappraising it, it's worth seven hundred, eight hundred, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be worth. I would that. hope so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can now get it refinanced based on seven, eight hundred, or, or nine hundred, whatever it's worth, and you would then leave in your ten percent deposit or your twenty percent deposit, and you can take the rest of the money back out. It just means your monthly payments will be a little bit more. But obviously, with that money, then you then have another lump sum because you've already got the gain from your house already, right? You've renovated it, you've made the money, and it's already appreciating. You don't need to leave any more 
in the house than you need to. So take that money out and then you can invest that but into in a Tesla new property. Stack. Correct. Invest <laughs> into Tesla or whatever you want to do. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I need to look into that. So th there's a lot of things that I like know I need to do. Mm. Will I actually ever do them? That's the biggest thing. <laughs> I think I leave a lot of money on the table with a lot of things that I do. But no, the the, the refinancing thing is is definitely something that I, I need to look into. No, I think... Motivated I me, dude. No, a lot of people do leave leave money on the table, especially with houses. Everyone does the same thing. They want to pay off their mortgage. But what's the point? Why do you need to set, pay off your mortgage for? If you want to pay off your mortgage, the best thing to do is not pay off your mortgage. Keep the money, invest it into something else, and then you're making double the amount of money faster. Mm -hmm. And then... Mm -hmm. Obviously, in two years' time, pull the money out of those, invest again. I, I think I think there's a lot of people, and I, and I was this way as well. I think a lot of people think that if you owe debt on anything, then you're like buying things you can't afford. Where I think that's not really the case. But exactly, I you know I bought the new uh, this new Audi, and normally with my cars, I've always been like I, you know I don't want to have any debt. I don't want to owe money to anyone, um, and I've always like bought all my cars and stuff outright. But this one, I took a hundred thousand dollar loan because I was like I. Well, what's going to make me more money, you know, not having this car payment and spending a hundred grand that's out right now, or can I take that hundred grand and put it into the market or put it into my business or do something that is going to yield me more than the three ish percent that I'm going to be paying on the interest. So, you know, it's, it's going to be negligible. So. Yeah, correct. And that way I think it's the same as what I'm trying to expand to you with the house too. As long as you've got a debt that's beating inflation and it's appreciating, then it's always good debt. If you're buying something yeah. that's definitely going down in value or and or you can't spend the money to make more money somewhere else, as you just explained. Yeah. So there's a, there's sure. a few ways there's a few ways to look at debt. But as long as it's beating beating inflation, you you you're all good. Yeah. Are you um are you still gaming? <laughs> I'm still I'm still playing that Fortnite, dude. <laughs> I'm trying, and I'm just as bad as I was the uh, a year ago when we played together. But I, I I one thing I've been trying to do, and I said I was going to do it for 2021, was to set up like a streaming schedule. But I think it's the same reason why I don't have a specific YouTube schedule because if I say an exact schedule and then I am not able to do something on that schedule, then I've let people down, or like I, I've I've not I'm not meeting an obligation that I said I was going to set for myself. Because everything changes and my life is so kind of like hectic that even though I'm thinking, okay, every Thursday, you know, at 8 p.m., I just, that's like th this part of my work. Like I, I stream and like I interact with people on that day every single time and, and Sundays. But then I guess I'm thinking like, what if, what if something comes up where I can't mm. do that? Like, do I keep making excuses of why there wasn't a stream? And so I don't think I was cut out to be a streamer. Um, I think I was... And I'm not good enough at video games. I, I I played video games so much as a kid that I think my entire life, I've just thought that I've, I'm really good at video games, but really, I, maybe I've never been good at video games. I've just been playing them for, you know, since I've been a kid. No, I don't think that's true. And the reason I say that is because I, I thought I was good at video games, but the kids these days are mm -hmm. a, a, a next level good. So I spoke to a, a guy recently and he used to be a semi-professional gamer and he said that he, 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 wouldn't even, he wouldn't even get close now. Yeah, the skill gap. It's, it's, almost like, it's almost like trying to learn how to skateboard now and get into like professional skateboarding when there's like 12-year-olds that are throwing themselves down 35 stairs. You're like, what do you, like, how do you compete with that? They are so good. Yeah, and that, that's the thing with like a game like Fortnite is the skill gap. It's not that someone's terrible. It's just everyone is so good at the game that you just, it, unless, unless you're a god at the game, you're ass. And, and with some games, everyone's like, if you don't get first place, you're ass. <laughs> and you know why that is, right? That's obviously the evolution of gaming. People can stream and show, case their skills. And then obviously mm -hmm. when that happens, other people copy them. And then yeah, it just keeps going up a notch. Whereas back in the day, 10, 12 years ago, that wasn't really possible. 20 years ago, when you played Super Mario, you could stream it to the world. So you were as only as good as your friend circle. Yeah. But, but now that's that's why it's 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 so cool to see how evolution takes its part, and if you can stream to the world, then everyone learns and gets better faster. Well, I, I think that, you know, the gaming is is super cool and it's super fun, and I, I love how it's become a like a real business and job for a lot of people and people to make money. And now for me, for example, like I really like Fortnite. For example, uh, I really like playing that game, and when I do it. I never want to play video games because I'm like, oh, I'm wasting my time. I can be doing something to, be to better everything I'm doing. But now I, I don't look at it as wasting my time because I'm like, okay, whenever I play video games, I'm going to stream as well. And maybe I have 100 to 150 people in there, but I'm, I'm continuing to be you know, a, 
a personality and entertainment. I'm, I'm connecting with those people and maybe people stumble in that have never seen my YouTube. And it's, I think it's all full circle. So I don't feel like I'm wasting my time as much when I'm, when I'm streaming. So now I make sure that if I do play video games, I'm always streaming. Yeah, and I don't think it's always good to be switched on anyway in terms of like always thinking about business and stuff because some some of the yeah. best ideas that I've ever had have just come to me naturally when I've when I've been on holiday or I've had a, had a complete break and then the mind resets itself and you can't think you know ideas just flow to you then sometimes you can think think about stuff so hard and it's just a blank wall. Yeah, I mean, imagine when you try to like okay, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna think up a brand name and a logo today. It's like you can't just you can't just do that. It's a lot of people will, will say like, oh, like I'm trying to think of a name for my company. I was like, the name for your brand or whatever will just come to you at some point. Like you think it won't, but it will. If you sit there and just like, okay, does this sound cool? Mm, nah, I don't like that. Let me do that. Like it like names and like stuff. Just, they just have to come to you. And I, I I truly believe that. Whether it's gonna be a day or a week, but when you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So I think we should uh, we should probably cut it there. If you stand the call after Max, we'll have a little chat as well. But I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much and uh, sharing some of your knowledge that you've worked endlessly, heartlessly for. I've seen it over the time and I can't wait to come over to uh, Texas. Absolutely, dude. I probably rambled way more than I, I should have and repeated myself a million times. But I hope uh, I hope everyone watching or listening enjoyed Lewis and myself just shooting the shit. It's been a long time. We've been no, we've known each other for a long time, man. It, it's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, we have. Connect soon again, man. I can't wait to can't wait to see your beautiful face. Cool, cool, cool. Right, I'll catch you later. All right, later, man. Nice one, nice one.